welcome to Ireland, a small island with a big reputation. For such a small country, the island of Ireland has more than its fair share of great attractions. It's got breathtaking landscapes and fascinating, friendly and talented people. Everything you've heard is true. Ireland is a stunner. It's loaded with magnificent places to visit, culture-laden cities, towns and villages, fabulous castles, medieval monasteries and spectacular natural wonders. But even with all this natural beauty and rich history, it's the people here who are the biggest attraction and provide the lasting memories of Ireland. Ireland has produced a large number of world-class poets, novelists, playwrights and actors. And many politicians in the English-speaking world and beyond might well have inherited their oratory skills from their Irish ancestors. These politicians that have excelled in various countries around the world have something in common which is the key to their success. And no, it's not just their Irish heritage. Each of these politicians learned how to get the best out of their brains. Today, we're going to discover their secrets. So stay tuned because you'll learn something fascinating about the amazing human brain. And you may even discover how to get the most out of your brain as well. Ireland is an island in the North Atlantic. It's located west of Great Britain and separated by the Irish Sea. Although small in size, Ireland is packed full of marvellous attractions that include natural wonders, monuments and castles. One of the most picturesque and romantic of these is the now ruined Dunluce Castle, located on the edge of a basalt outcropping in County Antrim, near the most northeasterly tip of Ireland, overlooking the Irish Sea. Nearby is the spectacular Dark Hedges, a beautiful avenue of beech trees planted by the Stuart family in the 18th century. It was intended as a compelling landscape feature to impress visitors as they approached the entrance to their Gregorian mansion, Grace Hill House. Two centuries later, the trees remain a magnificent sight and have become one of the most photographed natural phenomena in Northern Ireland. Further along the coast is one of Ireland's most impressive landscapes, the Giant's Causeway. And it really is an extraordinary sight indeed. Sitting at the foot of steep cliffs and stretching out into the sea is this natural formation of thousands of tightly packed basalt rock columns. The tops of the columns form flat stepping stones, all of which are perfectly hexagonal. They measure about 30 centimetres in diameter. Some are very short, others are as tall as 12 metres. Scientists believe they were formed by volcanic eruptions and cooling lava. The ancients, on the other hand, believed the rock formation to be the work of giants, hence the name, the Giant's Causeway. All of this is a reminder of the wonderful attractions that Ireland has to share. But these aren't Ireland's greatest gifts to the world. That surely belongs to its people and their culture. In the past 300 years, between nine and 10 million people born in Ireland have immigrated. By the 21st century, an estimated 80 million people worldwide claimed some Irish descent. So Irish culture has had a significant influence on other cultures. The Irish have taken their talents, culture, music and heritage all over the world. The list of Irish people who have excelled and made a significant contribution to society 
just goes on and on. They've been among some of the world's highest achievers. And like all high achievers, they've learned how to get the most out of their brain. The bottom line, mankind's greatest achievements are only possible because of the human brain. It's been said that you can manage something effectively only when you can identify, label and describe it. How does one do that with the human brain? Well, today's guest, a brain function specialist, can help us figure this out. Dr. Arlene Taylor is the founder and president of Realizations Inc., a non-profit corporation that engages in brain function research and provides unique educational resources. She's the author of several popular books related to brain function and practical applications to relationships and everyday living and creator of the Longevity Lifestyle Matters program. Let's meet Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor, welcome to The Incredible Journey. We're delighted to have you on today's program. And I'm delighted to be here, Gary. It's really fun talking with you about brain function. Everything we do and understand comes to us through the brain. What we see, what we hear, what we taste. Please tell us about the three most important senses and how they function with the brain. There's lots of ways to define senses, but from childhood, we're exposed to what we call the three main sensory systems. And those are the visual sensory system, which you take in through your eyes, the auditory sensory system, which you take in through your ears, and as sound waves beat against your skin. And the third one is called the kinesthetic sensory system, and that groups several things together. The sense of smell, the sense of taste, the sense of touch, the sense of temperature perception. Are you too hot? Are you too cold? Are you just right? Um, how you move your muscles and how your muscles feel. And those three main sensory grouping systems take in the sensory data and decode it for us because it's got to be interpreted, if you will, in the brain before it makes any sense. All sensory data is decoded in the neocortex, except for one thing, and that's the sense of smell. What's interesting about that is that layer also has emotional memory, if you will. So if you're a true kinesthetic, that is your number one sensory system, and you smell an odor, if you have any emotionally impactful memories about that, you've got them just like that because it gets decoded in that center part. Those decoding areas, and this blows my mind, can absorb and decode 10 million bits of sensory data per second. 10 million per second. Mm. Now, we've talked about bent from time to time, you have a sensory bent. What does that mean? It means that for your brain, one of these three main sensory systems, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, sensory data for one of those groupings tends to register most quickly and intensely in your brain. How does sensory preference or one's sensory bent impact an individual? Well, it basically influences the type of sensory data that you pay attention to, that's energy efficient for you, that gets your attention fastest. It also has to do with how you learn. So there's probably an individual learning style for every person on the planet, but in this grouping, how do you learn most easily? If you're a visual, you learn most quickly and easily by what you can see. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words. A diagram may be worth 2,000 words. <laughs> if you're an auditory, you learn most quickly and easily by what you hear and what you read because 
decoding speech sounds and reading words come out of the same part of the brain. And if you're a kinesthetic, you tend to learn most easily and most quickly by picking something up and manipulating it with your hands and holding it and feeling mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. touching it. How you communicate with others, your significant other, your marriage partner, your children, your teacher, student interactions, have a lot to do with sensory preference. Occasionally, a parent will bring a child to me and say, that my child was doing so well in school, and he's in a different room now, and he just not learning anything. And the first thing I want to know is, what's the child's sensory preference, and what's the teacher's sensory preference? because we tend to communicate and teach and share information in our sensory preference unless we make a different decision. So let's say the teacher's auditory, but you've got a visual child and there's nothing to see. They're just supposed to listen. The child will just not tend to take in the data. Or you have a visual or auditory teacher and a kinesthetic child, and the chair isn't comfortable and there's no air conditioning, and. Mm -hmm. They just can't learn. So it impacts every interaction, period. Dr. Taylor, are there any estimates about how many people fall into the three main sensory systems in terms of preference? There are, actually. And, you know, estimates are just estimates. But the latest data that I have says that approximately 60% of a population has a visual sensory preference. Now, you divide that between female empathizing brains and male systemizing brains, and you find that more males have a visual preference or a visual bent mm -hmm. than do females. And it's all about how the data look. You know, they're, they're looking with their eyes and taking in that data. Approximately 20% have an auditory preference or bent. I'm clearly an auditory, and that's a minority. When you divide that between males and females, you find that more females are auditory than males. And that's all about how does the data sound. And the same percentage holds for kinesthesia. About 20% of the population are kinesthetic. Don't have any data on more males or females seems to be fairly equally distributed. And those brains are interested in how the data is sensed. What's your sense of smell? What's your sense of touch? What's your sense of temperature? You know, what's your sense of muscle movement? And so on. And because of that, you'll often find kinesthetics make wonderful chefs. Dr. Taylor, how can you pick up someone else's bent or sensory preference? Well, I do it by listening. I pay attention to what they say because we tend to use words that match our sensory preference. For example, let's think about someone with a visual sensory preference. If you listen to what they say, you might hear phrases like this, oh, I see what you mean, or picture this. Or, ah, the light just went on. Or, it's crystal clear to me. Those are all visual words and metaphors. Yes. So you can get a sense that they may be visuals. How things look is of paramount importance to them, especially how they look. They tend to feel affirmed through positive visual stimuli. You look at them and smile. You give them a, a visual gift. I mean, that might be the person who loves to get a dozen red roses or, you know, a book with pictures in it or something like that. They tend to choose their professions if they have the option that will allow them to use your, their visualness in, in whatever way. They might be in television work. You know, they might be in artistic type of work. So auditories, if you listen, you will hear auditories say things like, that sounds okay. It's clear as a bell. 
keep your ear to the ground and tell me what you hear. They're very sensitive to sound. They're sensitive to volume. They're sensitive to pitch. They're sensitive to timber. They're sensitive to vocal inflections. And, and when it comes to clothing, there'll be one or two things. They like clothes that make noise or they can't stand their clothes to make any noise. They tend to feel affirmed when they receive positive auditory stimulation. So they like to be told, I love you. And sometimes people think they're showing that by their actions, and that's true. But an auditory likes to hear yeah. that. Mm -hmm. uh, they like to talk with their friends, you know, share information verbally. Uh, they like to read interesting books, sometimes a, a ebook, a regular handheld book, you know, is a good gift for an auditory. Yes. They often like music. Not all musicians are auditory, but auditories are often very sensitive and like certain types of music. And they actually like to get written communication because if they know the person and up pops an email, what happens in the brain of an auditory is he or she reads that email, they hear the voice of the person in their head. And that's a, a comforting thing. They're often very good listeners. And they sometimes choose professions that let them use sound. And the third group are the kinesthetics. If you listen to them, you'll hear phrases like, uh, that's not a good fit. Or, it doesn't feel right. Or, my gut says. Or, let's get together and hammer out a plan. So it'll be that kind of, those kind of words and metaphor. They're affirmed, again, through positive kinesthetic stimuli. Odors, tastes, touch, textures. It's really important how their clothes feel against their skin. Uh, temperature. Uh, they often like massages. They may like soaking, you know, in a tub with fragrant bath oils. Uh, maybe not so much for some of the other sensory systems. And they sometimes select professions that use their kinesthesia. So most likely many top athletes have a lot of kinesthesia because they know how to use their muscles. They know what their muscles can do. They can hone those muscular activities. So we need all of those again. Does our sensory bent or preference ever change? Now that's a complex question. We believe, some of us, that you're born with your bent. We use all three of them. We build skills in all three, but one of them likely gets your attention fastest. Sometimes parents expect their children to be exactly like them. They're not doing this unkindly. They're doing it from lack of knowledge. So sometimes children work really hard to develop a sensory system because that's what's honored in their family. That's not necessarily bad. But then they become adults. They begin to really own who they are. And it's almost, it's almost relaxing to know, well, that's why I struggled so hard because that's not what my brain registers so quickly. The other time it might look like you've changed it is you lose one of those sensory systems. Let's say that you develop severe glaucoma and lose the sight in your eyes, but you are a visual. Well, your other two sensory systems are going to take over and you're going to become much more auditorially aware of what's around you and you're going to begin to build uh, spatial kinesthetic skills to help you navigate. And somebody might say, boy, you know, you're really auditory, aren't you? Well, they have developed that system because their preference is no longer able to be used. So we don't think it changes innately, but, you, but the brain can help you do what you have to do, depending on what is. Fortunately. How would you sum up this topic? Let me sum it up by giving you three caveats. 
Just things to think about. Number one, you tend to relate to others in your sensory preference unless you make a different choice. So I could sit here with my eyes closed and talk to you for a week and be pretty comfortable. But that's only 20% of the population. So I need to have some diagrams and some pictures that people who are yes. visual yes. can relate to. Uh -huh. And hopefully the kinesthetics are sitting in a comfortable chair while I see this program. <laughs> you tend to feel accepted, loved most quickly when you receive affirmation in your sensory bent. And we alluded to that. If, if you know the person's visual and you aren't, do some visual things for them. Mm -hmm. If you know they're auditory and you're not, take them to a lovely musical program or give them CDs mm -hmm. of books they like to hear on tape because it's about what gets their brain's attention that makes the gift seem wonderful. And if you're kinesthetic, do they like fragrant, fragrant smelling soap? Or do they like bubble bath and things like that? Think about their sensory preference. And the third one is you tend to gravitate toward environments that make provision for your sensory preference and that reward your sensory bent, which means you feel comfortable there. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for sharing this relevant and important information that's going to affect the way we behave, and even our relationships with others. Thank you very much for being with us today. It's my pleasure, Gary, because you are absolutely correct. Information is powerful, and you can change relationships by understanding more about sensory preference and practically applying what you learn. Well, isn't your brain marvelous? It can use all the sensory systems, taste, touch, smell, sight and sound at the one time. And they're the only way we can relate to other people. We can look at them, talk to them, touch them, smell them and listen to them. And generally, we each have one of the senses that is strongest, that we're predisposed to using most. One of those sensory types will get our brain's attention fastest. Some of us are visuals, others auditory, others kinesthetic. Now, it's interesting to note that when Jesus was here on earth, he used these different ways to reach people and communicate with them. Some just saw him, others he spoke to, they heard him, and others he communicated with through touch. He knew the most effective way to reach every person. And he still knows the best and most effective way to reach each of us today. God communicates with us today and every day through a variety of ways, depending on the sensory type we are. Here are some of the ways that He communicates with us today and every day. Through His Word, the Bible. It's God's Word and is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Then through His Son, Jesus Christ. Through the words of Jesus in the Bible. In these last days, God has spoken to us through His Son, Jesus Christ and then through nature and God's creation. Through the marvels of nature, the enormity of space, the beauty around us, we see the power and love of God. Through the food we eat, we taste and see that God is good. Also through other people and fellow believers, God may use a friend, a teacher, a parent or a preacher to convey His message of truth to us. Next, through music, we can sense God's presence and hear His voice. And then through circumstances and experiences we have, we can see, feel, and experience the providence of God. And then through His Spirit, through the still, small voice, He communicates through our conscience. And finally, through prayer, God communicates with us and touches us with His presence. Now, if you'd like to know God better and experience Him more closely, you can invite Him into your life right now as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for creating us with senses 
so that we can appreciate the world around us and effectively communicate with other people and most importantly, with you. Lord, we want our relationships to be healthy and happy and we pray for the peace and fulfillment that comes from knowing you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. The human brain is amazing. The brain can use all the sensory systems at one time, and they're the only way we can relate to God and to others. If you're facing challenges in life and would like to get closer to God to experience true peace and inner happiness, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's the booklet, Reaching Out to God in Prayer. This book is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. In addition, you'll receive Dr. Arlene Taylor's sensory assessment so that you'll be able to quickly identify your own sensory strengths. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the gifts we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone or text us at 0436 333 5 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at PO Box 5101 Dora Creek, New South Wales, 2264 Australia or PO Box 76673 Manukau, Auckland, 2241 New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey to Ireland and our reflections on the wonders of the human brain, be sure to join us again next week. Until then, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. <laughs>